Good morning, everyone. So we're here to talk about In Search of Lost Solidarity. That sounds a bit like the next Indiana Jones movie, but it's not. Uh, we're going to explore the, different, uh, the reasons why we lost solidarities and ways to build new ones. So we are four panelists today, uh, which I'm going to present because else you're going to talk too long, I'm sure. So Saru Jayaraman. You are the co-founder of the Restaurant Opportunity Center, an organization, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, aiming at improving the work life of uh, restaurant workers by every action possible. You know, it's uh, people who are usually in a very difficult work environment, and your initiative is uh, helping them to get better. And uh, Fabrice Epelboin, you're an old-timer entrepreneur. Your bio said that you uh, survived the, fir the, pre the, bu the first bubble, the dot-com bubble. So congratulations. I hope you will survive the next one. Uh, you know, after the gold rush, you're okay? That's, yeah, it's comfortable. <laughs> Thank you. Mathieu Levantis, you are a freelancer and an entrepreneur as well, and you co-founded Mangrove, a collective of freelancers, but um, you'll tell more about that later. And Leticia Vito, a content manager for Switch Collective, which is an organization helping people to switch, to change their work life, to you know, create a new path for themselves. Okay, I got that right. Uh, so thank you to all, uh, all of you to be here. Uh, we have 30 minutes to spend together, and then we'll take uh, 10 or 15 minutes to talk with the audience. I'm sure they will have lots of questions. Start, you know, taking notes, because uh, I don't want people to sleep in the room. Uh, first question. Uh, you know, it would be the um, diagnosis question. I mean... Why are we asking this question right now? Why do we wonder where are the uh, traditional solidarities? What has happened? What is gone? And why did we lose these solidarities? Uh, maybe yeah, we wanted to start, Leticia? Yep. Okay. So the, the solidarities that, that we're discussing today or the solidarities that were built with the paradigm uh, that came from the 20th century, and that paradigm is the paradigm of mass production, and in the 20th century, there are numerous institutions that were built to create these solidarities and enable or promote the paradigm of mass production. So welfare state institutions that were created after World War II um, that were supported by uh, powerful unions. Um, these welfare institutions in a lot of the country, the, a lot of Western countries were uh, institutions that aimed at providing social protection for workers, um, so social security in the US, uh, 1935 with uh, Roosevelt uh, in France, immediately after the war, and in other countries, depending on which, uh, in the UK, uh, the NHS was built in 1948, etc., etc. So basically, we have all these countries with powerful institutions, public institutions, that provided uh, a protection against major risks. These risks were, of course, ill health or um, um, unemployment. Um, of course, the risk of being too old to be able to work, so retirement, et cetera, et cetera. And these institutions today uh, have not evolved together with our economy, with our society, with our social aspirations, etc. So we're at a point where we have institutions from a paradigm that's no longer ours and something else that's not yet been fully invented uh, or fully implemented because we have ideas but not nothing's completely done yet so the old institutions are disintegrating slowly little by little while nothing has fully replaced it so there are loads of people with risks who live with risks that are not covered that are not who are not protected. So that's where we are. I don't know if it's... No, that's pretty clear. Yeah. Thank you. Mathieu, you wanted to react maybe? Yeah, also. And because we talk a little bit also about work and another kind of solidarity that has been lost or maybe even never been fully there is the solidarity between workers, between colleagues. And it's, it's linked to the meaning at work, the meaning we have when we go and go working. When you work, you want to be happy, to be happy with your colleague, to have trust. And more and more people are unhappy at work because maybe they have no meaning when they come to work. They feel no solidarity between their co-workers, between their colleagues. 
And that's we as young workers felt when we created Mangrove, we were not, we didn't feel that we would be happy in most of the jobs that were here in the, in the big companies, at least in France. We would not also be happy as freelancers. So we created a, a new way of working when we have a common ideal. We have a common uh, yeah, idea about what is professional thriving. And because of that, we feel that there's a true solidarity inside Mangrove and that that's what should exist and uh, could you for everyone. And in state to the audience what Mangrove actually is? Because I'm, I'm sure it's, hmm. that's, what about it. that's what it is about. Yeah, it's a new kind of organization. Uh, which is uh, which work with principle of transparency uh, of horizontality we have no bosses and we started as a collective of freelancers let's say we didn't want to take regular jobs so let's we are we were freelancers we have problems as freelancers we don't like to be alone we sometimes lack collective energy collective meaning so we say hey, let's kind of build a tribe where we all want to go in the same direction and so and this organization we made it work with the, yeah, with the, we work together, we start building products together, working together for companies, and we set up new kinds of, um, we use technology to be organized together. We work remotely, so we are a strong collective, but we often work from different places, and we have a way of working of sometimes we work at the same place, sometimes we work differently, sometimes we go to retreats to work all together in, other, in another country, we rent a house, we go for three weeks, for example, we're going uh, next week in Portugal for three weeks. We were in Morocco before. So it's, it's a new way of living your professional life that we're building. And we really hope to inspire a lot of people to work like that and to have like thousands of people working like us uh, soon. Thank you. That sounds like tons of fun. Saru, uh, Leticia mentioned a kind of um, institution which existed before and which was quite useful, which were unions. And I wanted you to tell us a bit about the ROC, ROC initiative and how it differs from a traditional union. Yeah, well, first of all, I want to correct my biography a little bit. I am both the co-founder and co-director of Rock United. I'm also an academic. I'm a professor at, at UC Berkeley. Berkeley uh, and I uh, run a, food, a research center there. And I've written a couple of books on the industry. Um, and so I just want to back up and actually also answer this question about lost solidarities because at least in the United States, um, there have long been issues with solidarity, particularly along race lines in the United States among workers. So it's not true that somehow solidarity was perfect in the past and it's lost now. There have always been issues with solidarity among workers. Um, so, so let me tell you a little bit of background on us and, and our, my answer to this question. So. Um, my co-founder, Mamdu, who's here, worked at Windows on the World, which was the restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center, Tower One. On 9-11, on that morning of 9-11, 73 workers died in the restaurant and about 250 workers lost their jobs. We founded the organization just after 9-11 together with displaced restaurant workers. And since that time, we've grown into a national movement of about 18,000 workers, about 200 restaurant owners. Uh, and several thousand consumer members. So we're workers, employers, and consumers all working together for better wages and working conditions. And a lot of our work has been research and policy and organizing and advocacy. It's also been opening our own restaurants. We have uh, two going on five of our own restaurants that we've opened that are models for the industry for how to do things differently. But we've also worked with, as I said, about 200 restaurant owners who've changed their model as a result of working with us to have a more sustainable business model in terms of how they treat their own employees. And this is what I wanted to address, is that this is a historical, this goes back to a historical issue. The restaurant industry right now in the United States is the second largest and absolute fastest growing sector of our economy. It's over 11 million workers. One in 12 Americans currently works in the U.S. restaurant industry. One in two Americans has worked in the industry at some point in their lifetime. And yet it is the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. And the reason that you've got the largest and fastest growing sector of our economy proliferating the absolute lowest paying jobs, which by the way is the reason that we're going from an economy of one in three workers working in poverty to one in two American workers living in poverty, one in two working Americans living in poverty. It's half of all consumptive Americans. You know, I wonder where the consumptive power for the sharing economy is going to come from if half of Americans can't afford to eat or pay their rent. Um, so anyway, uh, largest industry proliferating the absolute lowest paying jobs and a lot of the history as to why that's the case uh, is actually related to a practice that actually came from here, which is tipping. Tipping originated in feudal Europe, 
when it came to the states, there was a massive populist rejection of the notion of tipping, saying this is a vestige of feudal Europe. Uh, it didn't go anywhere because the restaurant industry demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves, this is right around the time of emancipation, and not pay them anything and let them live on customer tips. And that idea that workers could be paid nothing at all and live on customer tips uh, has extended to this day when the current national minimum wage in the United States for restaurant workers is $2.13 an hour. That's the current minimum wage for tipped restaurant workers in the United States. And I'm going to talk later about how we've actually moved a ton of very large, high-profile restaurant companies to move away from this idea altogether and reject this practice. Uh, but what I'm getting at is that, yes, there have been unions, there have been worker organizations like ours, but our history of slavery, our very racialized past, has created schisms and solidarity that have existed from the very beginning are not new today. And I think what's happening with the sharing economy and everything that you all are talking about at this conference is a, re a reflection of existing inequalities, existing patterns and practices in the larger economy, not just in the sharing economy, which at least in the United States is less than 1%, as opposed to the restaurant industry, which is a full 10% of our economy. The sharing economy is less than 1%. It's reflecting existing problems and inequalities that have been there for a very long time. Thank you. Fabrice, uh, so you co-founded a startup called Yogosha. Mm -hmm. about, it's about bug bounty. You, you'll tell us what it is, but uh, do hackers get tips? No, really. Uh, they, they don't get tips. They get uh, hired. Well, not really hired, actually. Uh, the, the basic principle of a bug bounty is that a hacker is going to find in a, a security a breach somewhere on a technology and is going to sell the security breach to the owner of the technology. So it gives um, a very weird work when you compare it to the usual salary man in that uh, basically your work is, your income is directly related to your ability to f solve a puzzle in a way. Uh, and it creates some huge inequality. For example, uh, a gifted hacker on those systems can earn up to half a million dollar a year, and a non-gifted hacker will earn nothing, absolutely nothing. And it's not a problem within this community. It's absolutely not a problem because one of the basic founding values of the hacker community is meritocracy. Uh, there are some other forms of solidarity, but income inequality is not an issue in my community, and it's a very specific community, and I, I haven't heard of any other community, maybe in the financial service, where income inequality is not an issue. Beside that, there are some really very strong value uh, within this community. So this community is totally able to have some real solidarity. For example, when the, the Arab Spring uh, started, lots of people in the hacker community help uh, the Arab Spring had a positive issue. Uh, it wasn't very successful though, but still, uh, at least in Tunisia, it was quite successful. And uh, from time to time, there are some big major world issue, like WikiLeaks and stuff like that, fighting against surveillance, uh, where all the hacker community, most of the hacker community, gather together to fight for something or against something. So this is clearly some sort of solidarity. It goes from one country to another, the outspring was a wonderful illustration of that. And, and on the same, uh, in the same community, you have things that could appear as the very opposite of solidarity. So it's kind of a very weird uh, community. It's a strange mixture. It's yeah, a very indi strange Individualistic mixture. and elitism. There is some extreme solidarity. elitism, some extreme uh, revenue differences within the community, some extreme solidarity. And uh, on top of that, there's something called open source or free software, which basically is like, uh, let's take communism and let's apply it to uh, coding and hope. Oh, fuck, it works. It didn't work in the real world, but it does work in the coding world. Uh, so it creates some very weird community yeah. and, and kind of difficult to understand. It's a kind of parallel universe. I mean, if it, you compare it, it to the normal work universe. environment, yes. Yeah. I mean, fr from what you're saying, I, I hear that for the hacker community, this mixture of uh, individualism and uh, solidarity is almost uh, is deeply embedded. You know, it's a cultural feature. It's totally so embedded. Uh, one of the main reasons is that um, access to knowledge, especially today with the internet, uh, is available to everyone. And 
you can have a 14 year old kid who will be a wonder at hacking and who will make a lot of money on those systems like bug bounties uh, and who can come out of nowhere. So uh, your chance at succeeding do not depend on where you live, where you were born, uh, what kind of education you had. Because basically, the most gifted hackers in France, for example, uh, have never done any kind of scientific or uh, computing studies. Um, still, they're the best. And sometimes they, they came out of nowhere, sometimes they came out of a wealthy uh, background doesn't really impact on their ability to become somebody within this community and to make a lot of money. Yeah, that's interesting, but it's really a, a parallel universe. It, so it is totally parallel. Yeah. So, and how does it work, I mean, in the normal non-hacking world, you know, where people um, usually don't like inequality that much, where there is so much, I mean, you, you were mentioning when you are paid $2 an hour, I mean, what kind of solidarity can you expect from someone who is just living such, in such a, a poor way? I mean, how does it work in the, this work environment? It doesn't work. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I just want to reflect on the speaker, and I don't know his name, who was in the tent just before us and was saying that a founder of Uber said, oh, the most successful business models are the ones that take off. And perhaps people might think of Uber as a successful business model in the restaurant industry. Certainly for 100 years, it's been considered to be a successful business model to pay $2.13 an hour. And what we're seeing in this moment, at least in America, is that our industry is literally imploding. It's imploding because you're, uh, we are seeing the biggest rift and the biggest labor shortage in our industry's history. The biggest rift, meaning all of these new and growing and successful companies are leaving the old model, are leaving, uh, there's something called the National Restaurant Association, which is made up of the chains. It's led by McDonald's and Disney and uh, Applebee's and Olive Garden and uh, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut. These are the companies that lead the, the chains, that lead the National Restaurant Association. We have multiple, multiple corporations that are walking away, literally leaving the National Restaurant Association, following a new business model, working with us. We've set up an alternative National Restaurant Association, as I said, of about 200 very high profile companies, some of whom have decided to just get rid of the whole idea of tipping altogether, some who are saying we have to pay at least $15 if we want to succeed and thrive and survive. Some are saying this old model is not successful. And I would argue to look at Uber as well in the same way, that you know, ultimately, maybe you think it's a successful business model in the moment, but if the people who are working with you and for you and under you are not thriving, are not able to succeed, are not able to survive, are not able to ultimately consume. Remember Henry Ford. I don't know how much people know about Henry Ford in Europe, but Henry Ford's model Quite was... Quite a lot. I'm sorry? Quite a lot. It's pretty okay. big. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, the model was you need your workers to be able to afford the cars coming off the assembly line, otherwise you're not going to succeed yes. as a business. But that's and what the, the Walmart model completely destroyed, in a way. You exactly, know, um, exactly. But Walmart, I don't think, is going to last. McDonald's is losing massive amounts of market share to Chipotle, which we've been working with. I have a new book out. I have a couple copies if you want to see. We profile the growth of Chipotle and other companies that are taking what we call the high road to profitability and completely walking away from this old model. And so you ask, you know, does it work ultimately to pay 213? It doesn't work. And that's why so many companies are saying it's not working, massive labor shortage. We've got to figure out a different model. And you see our industry imploding. And I would encourage the sharing economy in its inception to think about what ultimately is a sustainable business model, not a successful, but a sustainable business model that works for everybody. Thank you. And uh, Leticia, maybe for you, because I guess you, at Switch Collective, you, I mean, you welcome people who are badly injured by the normal wo work life, by, the, by the, their former jobs. And if the, the lack of solidarity, one of the reasons people come to you? Um, certainly, in, in, a, in a way, yes. So we, we help people redesign their work lives, and that implies for for many of them, for at least for some of them, leaving their old jobs. And leaving one's old job isn't as easy as it seems. At least it's more, there are more barriers than there are probably in the US. Um, and so they, these, they, there, there are a lot of new unconventional workers who will 
uh, choose different forms of work who will be freelancers, who will have multiple activities and slash, so-called slashers, who will be entrepreneurs, but sometimes with low revenue. Sometimes they even have revenues. It's not just a question of money, uh, although inequalities are certainly a huge problem here too. But it's also a problem that these unconventional workers are facing issues, are facing risks that are not... Um, covered for them, and that will be for the conventional ones. And that's one of the difficulty of leaving your own job is that you uh, are in a position where you suddenly have to face these risks. And these risks obviously include health, uh, et cetera, the ones I mentioned, but one major risk, for example, is housing. Housing is a huge problem uh, for people who are freelancers, for people who are entrepreneurs, because in France you need so many guarantees to be able to rent a place. Well, the market, the real estate market in Paris is such that um, to get an apartment as a young or even not so young freelancer, uh, you will face extreme difficulties. You will have to be super smart. Think of family solidarities, use your parents, but what if, what if you don't have parents who can actually help you get um, an apartment? So housing is, you know, of course it's related to revenues because the more revenues do you have, the easier it will get, but it's not just revenues because there are lots of freelancers today um, I speak about freelancers, but it's the same for entrepreneurs. It's the same for everyone who basically is not a salaried worker. So that's also include people with short-term contracts in France. Um, basically, getting access to housing is impossible. So renting a place, let alone getting obtaining a loan from a bank, that's just out of the question. So that's one of the new risks that we're facing. And uh, we need the new institutions or new, form, new forms of solidarities to address that, and it mainly concerns unconventional workers. And Mathieu, you are one of these unconventional workers, and um, that's interesting because there, I, I hear there are problems we can address at the, an institutional level, but there are things, solidarity, that we can build, build uh, very grassroots, you know, at the grassroots level, and I'm guessing that what you do, what can, what can you address within Mangrove, and what can't you address, address sorry. Um, what we can address is, yeah, at the very grassroots level, to build an organization where people at least feel good. And to do that, you need to understand like the basic principle of solidarities and just to build them. So yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, so I have an, in Mangrove, we are all from the startup world. That's why we can really build something. We are builders. And instead of maybe trying to think what could be good, we could say, okay, today, what, what would we like? And what can we do right now with maybe the, the 40 of us to, to build something? And for example, we see that uh, we like to talk more about our work, about our daily missions. And sometimes in regular jobs, you don't talk with your colleagues because maybe there are conflicts. Maybe you know that what you say will be uh, repeated to your boss, things like that. But in Mangrove, as we ha really have a, a framework of trust, we build something like you are in, um, in pairing. Uh, in a, so you are in a pairing, you have a buddy in Mangrove in the tribe. Uh, each week, it changes. So for example, this week, I will be in pairing with Adrien. And every day for each week, I will talk 10 minutes with Adrien about my job, about how I feel, how, about um, maybe the troubles I might have with my missions. And just these small things, really builds the community because after maybe a, a few weeks I will have exchange with everyone, it will make stronger bonds, stronger links that if I just talk to my three friends that I made at the beginning because I took coffee with them. And these small things, really small things that we build, we use uh, and technology helps us to build tools uh, to, to facilitate that kind of exchange even if we're not in the same room all the time. We, uh, helps us to to feel better, to have a, um, yeah, to feel a, a connected community. And uh, something I really believe in is uh, exploration and doing. So once you've done that, next week you say, okay, what can I do next to feel even better in my job? And so we say, okay, we like to, sometimes we start to feel bad, but we don't know we feel bad. So we build something where um, or a process where every week we'll say, okay, how do you feel about your job? Oh, I feel, oh, this week I feel kind of bad because, oh, it's true, I feel bad, why? 
I feel bad because my mission is not going well. And then you, you start um, exploring, talking with the others. So it's the second thing we built. It's like the collective mood so of the collective. So several tips and tricks to avoid, you know, living in a degraded, degraded work environment. From the mm -hmm. and, uh, but and my question would be, and maybe Fabrice, uh, I'd like to hear you on that and after Saru. Um, there are problems that we can only address, it seems, we used to address nationwide, you know, at the very macro level, thanks to institutional, uh, institutional means. And should we completely, you know, forget about that and just build solidarities at a micro level? Or if there's still room for welfare state and, I don't know, social security, whatever you call it? Uh, I'm afraid the answer is that <coughs> there is absolutely nothing you can do to keep this welfare state, at least in France we used to have one. Um, um, there's nothing you can do to, to preserve it. I, it is collapsing. And um, as most of you probably realized, uh, France, France democracy is quite twisted, and, uh, which means basically the average citizen has absolutely no impact on anything. Um, all the, the institutions who are supposed to represent the French citizen do not represent anything. And we know that basically because we're ha we have entered since a few years uh, an era of radical transparency, which means that, for example, let's take Europe. We have a, a huge scandal recently named the LuxLeaks, basically revealing that um, the best tax haven in the world was Europe. And uh, that the guy heading the, uh, uh, the European Union... Some sound of the, the guy heading the European Union is basically uh, the architect of this tax heaven. So there is no way you can <coughs> believe in solidarity in Europe after this revelation. And this revelation is one amongst many, many, many others. Uh, and I'm only talking about the tax heaven problem, which is kind of the, the root of all evil when it comes to solidarity. So I don't think uh, there's anything we can do uh, except maybe a revolution, um, to reinforce or bring back the welfare state. So basically the answer is that <coughs> we must build something else because if we don't do that, when it will totally collapse, we'll be naked uh, and we won't have anything else. And I'm pretty convinced that we can build solidarity within communities. The problem is it's going to be a community-based world and in France, uh, it's uh, yeah. the French uh, system is not designed at all for communities. Uh, the U.S. system, the, the English system, is based on a community view on society. France is built on the very opposite view on society. And the fact is, we've been building a community-based society since basically the 80s. And we've been without acknowledging it, you're right. I mean, without just never acknowledging it, but in the fact. Uh, we've been building the French society based on community since the 80s, uh, and we've been dealing with migration with, uh, and answering migration with community-based uh, society. Today, we are kind of pretending to realize that, and we haven't really realized that as a whole. But we, ha we will have to face that. And we're already facing solidarities within those communities uh, that are sometimes quite effective for the better or the worse, but we're clearly today facing solidarities within those communities, so we can build new ones in any kind of communities. And I think mangrove is a really nice example uh, of building something that doesn't really exist in the real world. And think about nomadism. And nomadism is a core value, in my view, of um, the upcoming upper class. Uh, if you're not necessarily rich and healthy, but if you're um, from a, a a future elite, shall we say, uh, you will have this ability to be a nomad mm -hmm. tomorrow, which will uh, open up a whole different world. I mean, if you don't like what's going on in France, you can go somewhere else. Uh, if you speak English, it's not a major deal. Uh, if you have those solidarity within a transnational uh, community, it will be really easy to move from a country to another. So this nomadism, which could be considered as a right, it's not a right today, but it could be considered as a uh, and it can be built within a community. It's already built in a community. If you take, for example, the Moroccan community, uh, a Moroccan coming from Morocco and coming into France will benefit from those solidarity. We can so at least build. it's efficient and it's it does efficient. Exist, yeah. We have a model. It's been done before. It has been done since centuries, if not millennial. Uh, so we can build those kind of solidarity. 
So in a way, you're saying we are replicating the uh, solidarity model which existed in the U.S. And while the, in the U.S., they're just you know, getting to uh, the any, Obamacare and any, building any diaspora, nationwide solidarities. Any diaspora is a, a solidarity-based uh, yeah, uh, community. So we can, if you have a, a transnational community, you can build exactly the same kind of solidarity. And there are tons of examples mm -hmm. to be gathered within existing diaspora. And then God knows there are plenty of existing diasporas. Thank you, Fabrice. Uh, do we have any question in the audience? Can I respond? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead and okay. people just reflect, think about the good question and wave. You have one minute. <laughs> yeah, I, I, maybe I'm, I have a very different view coming from a, a very different place than other panelists, but um, you know, our, our welfare state, we don't have one. You know, 90% of restaurant workers don't have a single paid sick day, meaning they cannot take a day off and, and I can share stories from my first book about workers working with swine flu and typhoid fever, serving food in very fancy fine dining restaurants to you as tourists coming to America because they cannot actually, they're not allowed to take a day off when they are sick. We don't have paid sick leave. We don't have any kind of paternity leave. We, we, have, we have nothing, let alone welfare. We have nothing at all. And so to say that I, I, I don't agree that you, it's being completely decimated and I hope you all are not thinking of losing everything that you have. Yeah, well, not totally, not totally collapse, and I would hope that you would not give up on the things that we are fighting for in the United States, um, because. All right. Well, we. I would argue we don't either. Our democracy is completely controlled by corporations that, frankly, control uh, everything about our quote-unquote democracy. So, um, given that. <laughs> Uh, you just cannot ignore it. You can build a wonderful, inspirational, alternative, solidarity economy. We opened our own worker-owned restaurants. Everything you're doing is beautiful and wonderful and important. And we can't at the same time ignore that the vast majority of people, at least in the United States, I don't know about Europe, but in the United States still work in, for massive corporations that completely exploit them and underpay them. And there, are, there is a way to divide and conquer that other element as well. So we've got to build the inspirational. We, in, for our part, have looked at that massive kind of traditional economy and split it. We found leaders in that commun community that are willing to move in a different direction, like Danny Meyer and Chipotle and very large corporations that have been, been willing to work with us. But even they have said, as restaurants that take what we call the high road to profitability, we can't stick our necks out and do this alone. And they've joined us in coming to Congress and state legislatures and saying, we need livable wages as policy because that's the right policy for this industry. And so absolutely we need the state to be involved. We need to both build the alternative move, divide and conquer the traditional, and we need the policy. We need all three. Did you say you wanted to react? Yeah, quick word. Um, just that I, for one, am not willing to give up on my, um, on my institutions, on my country's institutions, and I believe our sécurité sociale, our social security system must be, must be defended, must be protected, must be extended, extended to include different kinds of workers and to include different forms of risks. And one of the things that that our communities can do is raise awareness on these issues, is basically leverage a form of political power that we have. And our institutions may be partly corrupt, our politicians may be incompetent, all of that is probably true, but I'm not willing to give up, and, and with the powers of these communities we can, that we can leverage, we can still achieve much, as shown with the success of Obamacare and, and other things. It's, it's still possible. Maybe I'm an optimist. I agree with you. I have a comment on the fact that uh, all welfare systems or social protections, they, they can be sustainable if there are two things we have to do. The first one is a proper taxation that really redistributes money. There is money. It's growing. There is, I mean, the, uh, the, the rich wealth is growing. It's, oh, we have to go get the money where it is, and we have to stop definitely. only taxing this. work for one. Just a moment. And then the second thing, as you were saying, we have to enlarge the access to social protection because for now, the only ones who are really protected are the people who are in open-ended, full-time contracts. The others are in loopholes, more or less following, but we have to have an inclusive social protection system. And therefore, we need unions to open up to these workers and not focus on only employment, I believe. Okay, but so we, let, have let, make, let, we have to make, we have to make, we have to make our, our, let, our let, ourselves. Let me, I guess you're not French. Um, I, I, I live in Belgium, we're neighbors. Yeah, so you know pretty much uh, the French system. So you know our unions. <laughs> 
utterly crippled and do not represent anything. Uh, and it's not a way to change things. There are probably some ways to change things, but it's definitely not unions in France. Uh, when it comes to tax heaven, um, unfortunately, I mean, how much scandal do you need? Uh, LuxLeaks, Cayman Leaks? Uh, I, I'm not even going to count them. Those things are here to stay. They will not move. As Warren Buffett state, there's a war going on between the rich and the poor, and the rich have won. It's not the rich are winning, the rich have won. And if you take um, Warren Buffett's uh, track record, the guy's pretty good. Whatever you think about capitalism, he pretty much understands what's going on. And unfortunately, those tax havens are here to stay. The idea that we should take the money where it is, is pretty cool, but it's not gonna work. Um, second, uh, there's something named quantitative easing that uh, Central Bank of America and the Central European Bank and even the Bank of China has been doing intensively this, this past decade since the last major financial crisis, which means that, yes, there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. There's actually so much more money today than 10 years ago that you can seriously ask yourself, what is this money's worth exactly? I mean, if I have a printing system that prints $10 billion and give it all to you, how much is this worth, basically, if I multiply the money by 10 within 10 years, is $1 still worth $1? Or are we living in a dream that the dollar is still worth a dollar just because there are hundreds of billion somewhere in Panama? But if you take those billions and billions out of Panama and put it in the real economy, the, the currency will just collapse. So do not so, expect any solidarity from the rich. No, I, I, I'm quite <laughs> pessimistic on, uh, on that. I don't expect that's, any... Maybe woman. that's the, mess <laughs> loss, the main only, loss solidarity. Not only so don't, so I for this, we, we have to reach to the end of the panel, but we have one question over there. I, so I'd ask you to be very short because we're running out of time. That was you. Yeah, I think so. Um, so you're completely right. Uh, the poor lost the war. But the war is a permanent one, and we have to fight back. Oh, of course. And, uh, which, and we can fight back, and we will. So it, it is, <coughs> the problem is not to fight against the system. The point is building a new paradigm. And this is what is all about here with We Share. Yeah, I think, first of all, you're totally right. There's no point in finding the system. It is way too powerful. And since a few years, it has gained a new weapon, which is mass surveillance, and <coughs> totally will cripple any ability, any will to fight the system. So you got totally right that if you want to do something, you have to build something else. You, there's no point in no, fighting the system. I'm sure Sarah would disagree with you because but, it but seems Sarah you won the battle, disagree. you know? <laughs> for tr just building alternatives. We build alternatives, but if we aren't simultaneously looking at where the majority of people work, and, and we've been winning. I'm sorry, we're winning. We, we, we've won we, that decades ago in France. So there's a strong actually, cultural no, gap here. you're still at nine, nine euro 60 is your minimum wage, and we just talked to waiters last night who make eight. So I'm sorry, you're not completely there. I mean, you're definitely better than us in a lot of ways, but the point is, all my, my only point is who's better, worse. We've got a lot of things to learn from France and from Europe. But, but we have not given up, even though we're probably the worst nation on earth when it comes to inequality, we have not given up. We keep fighting and we're winning. And we've gotten farther in some states in the United States than you have here. So I think the point is to not, and, and the way that we're winning is not by the old models either. I agree with you on that. We're not just workers fighting, fighting, fighting. We're workers dividing the opposition, working with employers, building consumer support. You know, we've built a massive consumer organization that's standing alongside us and saying we don't agree with this system either. We, through our tips, should not be funding multi-billion dollar corporations and paying their workers wages. So we've got workers, employers, and consumers. We're, we're creating new models, absolutely, but we're not just creating alternatives. We are fighting the hegemony as well. We're fighting the mainstream as well, and we're winning. We're fighting, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah.